in relation to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on health and social services. They relate to children and young people in Wales. I'm very pleased to welcome Vaughan Gethin AM, Minister for Health and Social Services, Julie Morgan AM, Deputy Minister for Health and Social Services, Albert Heaney, Deputy Director General of the Health and Social Services Group, Nicola Edwards, Deputy Director, Childcare Play and Early Years, Jean White, Chief Nursing Officer, and Tracy Bre Breheny, who is Deputy Director of Mental Health, Substance Misuse and Vulnerable Groups. Um, thank you all very much for your attendance to today. Uh, we appreciate your time. We've got lots of questions that we'd like to cover, which we'll go straight into with questions from Sean Gwen Um Plan da. Um, Good afternoon. How much do we understand about how this virus impacts children and young people and their role in transmitting the virus and okay um I think it's fair to say that our understanding is developing across all age ranges uh, about the virus and its impact. Uh, it's still the case that children and young people are less likely to be affected significantly by COVID-19 than by people with a range of healthcare conditions and in particular the age gradient that we've seen uh, and that's underpinned the advice we've given to the whole population uh, about self-isolation by people in age categories, as well as that um, extremely vulnerable group with eyes to shield. Um, we still don't understand everything about the role that children have to play in transmitting of the virus. And this is one of the difficulties we face because in cold and flu, uh, children transmit the virus and they're also susceptible in particular to flu as well. That's why we have a childhood immunization program for the flu as well. Um, we do know that there's some developing evidence about um, what's called a Kawasaki-like syndrome, um, but that's affecting very small numbers of children. We have one possible case in Wales, a child who's in critical care, um, but that isn't confirmed. That's still a developing uh, knowledge base, so the rest of the world is still trying to understand that too. Uh, but the general rules still apply that children are less likely to be affected than older people, uh, but can nevertheless still become unwell, uh, and that's, if you like, one of the few positives in this condition. But as I say, we're still learning. So I wanted to try to present uh, a fully accurate or finalised picture of knowledge in this area. And in terms... Pediatric or uh, coronavirus. Um, Pitai, um, Savasva, Hanodan Fotis, and Dig with Board, uh, Hon and Chair. Sorry, excuse me, Chair. So, so, sorry, up, up with apologies to the member. My translation stopped after a while. So I heard the first part translated and then it just fell off. I'm really sorry, but I don't want to try to answer a, a different question than the one that may be being asked. I don't know if that's fair to the member or um, other members of the committee. Can, can we check that translation is, is back on, please? And maybe Chan could repeat her question. Testing interpretation. I can hear, yes. Okay, Sean, would you mind repeating that, please? Not at all. I was discussing NHS services, including critical care services, and I was asking whether there is sufficient capacity in place to manage any increase. We've, of course, hope that there won't be any increase, but should there be an increase, particularly in paediatric cases of coronavirus? Let's say such a thing were to happen, and this rare syndrome that you mentioned did emerge here in Wales? Do we have the capacity in place to deal with these and with the impact of coronavirus more generally on children? Uh, at this point in time, the answer is yes. There is always a significant caveat, though, and the but that comes in there is that despite the fact that we've got a plan, a 
for surge capacity in paediatric care. And so when we uh, increase critical care right across the National Health Service, we of course looked at paediatric uh, care as part of that as well. So we can flex up our capacity. But the challenge in all of that is, it's part of my caution and the government's caution about moves out, out of lockstep. So it was much easier to go uh, out of lockdown rather. It's much easier to go into lockdown than to come out of it. And I know you heard evidence from the education minister last week uh, about the approach that she wants to take and the principles behind uh, doing that. And so actually we'll need to think carefully about if we are reopening schools even on a limited basis, what that then does to the circulation of coronavirus within that group of children as well as within the wider community. And then to try to understand whether the current capacity we have planned for in surge capacity is still going to be enough. Because actually the real one of the real success stories, the first stage of the fight with coronavirus, is that we haven't had our critical care capacity filled up. Um, it's been extended, and the extension has meant that we haven't been overtopped. If we hadn't done that, we definitely would have been. And we'll need to carry on testing ourselves and seeing what's happening and look at the evidence and making sure the plan we already have got that we published for paediatric critical care is still fit for purpose. And again, to reconsider if we need to do things differently. But that's part of the difference being a minister at the moment. You don't know everything that's coming. Uh, and on this disease in particular, uh, we do know that we, uh, we're still learning with each passing day. Hello, yes, um, those are the questions I had on that section. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, we'll move on now then to some questions on access to health services from Dawn Bowden. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Minister, just some um, concern that that, uh, that you will have heard about uh, in, in terms of parents and carers maybe not taking their children into the, the healthcare system for mm. other conditions uh, while the yeah. coronavirus pandemic is is with us how are you monitoring that situation at the moment and uh, you know whether you've you've had to look at your own communication strategy in that relation in relation to that we've had to look at some specifics around communication so challenges about um not just different languages but about how we get messages to people in a very different environment and it's really challenging so for example, our, our health visitor service has absolutely not stopped. We've had to think about the way it works. And I had this conversation earlier this week with the chief nurse. But the bigger challenge are parents refusing to engage in the service. And we understand people's fear and anxiety, but that then means that their family, and in particular their child, isn't getting the sort of proactive care that we would want them to have. And so it is a real concern both at the professional leadership end that the chief nurse has, and for ministers as well, about how we can get through. And that's actually about rebuilding people's confidence in the service. Uh, and that isn't straightforward because there's a broad concern about coronavirus still circulating. But I think for us it's really important to reiterate that we have thought again about how to provide the service we thought about how to protect staff and families and the very clear message to parents is to please make sure that when health and care professionals are calling to help and support your family please discuss your concerns with them we're doing even more remotely by telephone and by online as well there are times you need to be physically in the same place for example on routine uh, vaccinations because we certainly haven't stopped that program either and i really wouldn't want to see that one of the, the the unintended consequence of what we've done is that if parents don't engage with that service, that we could potentially see a rise in other diseases. We're all, I think, not just in your constituency, but others who are on this call and others as well, see, are seeing an occasional reappearance of measles, and that's because people didn't engage with the vaccination program. I don't want either myself or a different health minister in the future to be sat here talking about how, in years to come, the failure to engage in vaccination programs led to clearly avoid it but significant harm to children young people in the communities they live in. Thank you. Jean, you wanted to come in? You need to unmute yourself. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to add to what the, the Minister said. So I, I approached the immunisation lead in Public Health Wales to see exactly what has been happening recently. And they said at the very beginning of the outbreak, parents were very reluctant about coming forward for their um, uh, routine immunisations. But recently, uh, through lots of uh, energy from the um, uh, immunization clinics and the leads within it, of reaching out to families, that trend seems to have turned. And um, there is now um, a much better attendance. And, um, you know, it is, is one of the most important things we can do to protect our, our, our children is to make sure they have their vaccination. So 
yes, there was a, a bit of a downturn, but it does seem to be improving at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And that answered my second question, Chair, so I'm happy to leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to go on now to some questions about mental health from Sean Gwenllian. Sean? It's a cause of great concern to us all, of course, in terms of the impact of this crisis on mental health and well-being among our children and young people. So what assessment has the government undertaken of the impact on these aspects in young people and what work is being done to understand the impact of the pandemic and what long-term or longer-term measures will be put in place and what support services will be put in place. Again, I think it's helpful that you've already heard from the Education Minister last week because uh, I think it's the first of her key principles for uh, returning to school is the impact on the emotional health and well-being of children. Um, so children's mental health are a central concern and remain so for both myself and the Education Minister. Um, <clears throat> part of the honest challenge again is that we don't fully understand the impact on the mental health and well-being of, ch of children but we do expect there will have been an impact uh, so we're working together with both health boards and our own knowledge and analytical services across the government to both try to further understand what that is and the difference until we have more contact with families we may not fully understand that and that's a real point of concern for me and all of the unknowns within this the impact on mental health and well-being is absolutely one of them because we're looking at how we then develop not just a recovery plan for the economy but a recovery plan around mental health how we support people and that will have to be informed by the understanding of what's happening when we get more engagement with families about the level of need and then how we need to think about that obviously it's a key factor for the return of schools but actually the life children and people leave outside of the school environment and that will be difficult because we're going to phase out of lockdown it's not going to be a one-hit measure that absolutely isn't going to happen we're either going to at each point what difference has been made? What more can we do? And again, the efforts we're making to make sure that our online support services and our telephone support services, that we keep on reminding people that they're, that they're there and they're available and want people to make use of them. Because I know, as this committee said, we'd much rather be able to support people and intervene earlier rather than wait till there's a much bigger problem in a period of months in the future. <laughs> So, in reality, there's been no assessment undertaken because it's difficult to do that. So, the full picture in terms of the outcomes of the crisis, you don't know what they are at the moment, as things stand. We can't know because uh, we don't have that level of contact. There's a developer, I wouldn't say that no work's being done, but I couldn't tell you honestly uh, that work is finalised. We have a definitive understanding of the picture. If I'd tried to say that, then I'm sure you'd ask me, how on earth can you say that? Um, if you're not having regular contact with people, you can't possibly understand the picture. Uh, and it's much better to say we don't understand the full picture. We know there have been an impact. We're working alongside health boards and others, but we'll know more as we carry on having more contact with families. And we look at a variety of different areas, again, both to re reform the recovery plan, uh, but also to understand what we need to do at various points in the future. And the picture that we're seeing isn't straightforward. And we need to make sure we don't try to pretend to ourselves or to the public that there is a one-off measure that will allow us to be successful in all the areas that we'd want to be. But can you give the committee an assurance today that this area of mental health and well-being is going to be a priority for you as health minister? Of course. Uh, not just on the work we've done in the past, not just because it's one of the key principles of the education minister on the reopening of schools, but it is a real worry list for me about how we understand the impact on the mental health and well-being of children and young people. And to move forwards, we don't end up with uh, an entire generation of children and young people who grow up with a range of damage because we haven't thought about what that will look like. So the mental health recovery plan will, of course, be of very real importance to me. Uh, in amongst all the other priorities I have, I'm certainly not going to allow the mental health and wellbeing of children and young people to be forgotten. And how does the current capacity in terms of child and adolescent mental health services compare to service capacity prior to the coronavirus outbreak in Wales? 
Have you had to shift some resources over from CAMS, for example, in order to deal with more general aspects of coronavirus? No, we've actually got, um, maybe perhaps it might be helpful, Chair, if Tracy Brahenny could say something about the way that we're monitoring uh, the impact we have in terms of we've got a reporting tool, but also weekly contact with leads in CAM services. Of course. Thanks, Thanks Minister. Yes, on that question, we, we moved pretty quickly at the beginning of the pandemic phase to put in place, as the Minister says, a weekly monitoring tool with um, look of all local health boards. So through that tool, we, uh, we look at that every week in terms of um, uh, collecting information. Once national reporting has been stood down, we are picking up um, assurance through that tool on things like staff sickness in, in CAM services, referral numbers, uh, and so on. So we do have that tool in place. And at the moment, that's telling us that, that uh, the system can meet the capacity, has the capacity to meet need. Also, staff cams Wedical is have cam staff been shifted over to do other work during this virus outbreak? There has been some uh, movement, uh, is my understanding, around uh, uh, kind of health boards, particularly where in the first phase of the um, epi epidemic, the uh, concentration was on inpatient provision <laughs> and critical care. But my understanding is from the latest tool that we looked at last week, those staff are gradually not just returning to work from self-isolation or whatever, or from different parts of the system. And then what about the capacity for CAMS primary mental health services? Has there been reduction in that capacity since the beginning of the pandemic in terms of inpatients? Because that's what I'm hearing, that there has been such a reduction, but how are those patients then treated and served? In terms of um, inpatient capacity, uh, that is uh, in the system in both North Wales and in the South Wales unit at, at the moment. Um, there were some um, discharges um, of, of young people, uh, but um, we've had the assurance that that was only uh, undertaken where it was clinically safe to do so and where the community uh, uh, support was in place. And finally, in this section from me, given that schools are of course closed and that schools are so very important in terms of signposting young people towards services, how can young people access appropriate services, online services, for example? How are they signposted towards those services at the moment? Uh, well, we've not closed off general practice. And as you know, we've expanded the ability for people to access services uh, in an online manner. We've expanded a range of telephone advice services. So the telephone advice service we, uh, we already provide, we've made sure that's maintained and both myself and the Deputy Minister referred to that on a number of occasions. I think the real struggle uh, and the real difficulty is, is actually how you punch through different messages when the broader news agenda is so overwhelmingly focused on headline messages in other areas. And that is, again, a worry for me, but the communications we have within the health and care system, people should know where to refer people to and how to provide access to uh, both telephone and uh, online support that continues to be available. And actually, as I say, we've expanded that right across our healthcare system. That's why I'm, look I'm keen to see continue uh, into the future, whatever the post-COVID-19 world is. I uh, don't want really to the progress we have made in the online provision of services. Of course, most children and young people expect to be able to access services uh, in an online manner already. But of course, there will be some who are missed. They may fall between two stools because they won't know where to turn. Yeah, and that's, that, again, comes back to our, our challenge of how we help children, young people in their context, their families, to know where support and advice and guidance is. And many people end up defaulting to their general practitioner um, if they can't find advice somewhere else. So that's why the information we're providing through general practice to signpost people so those pathways haven't been closed off. So making sure people have alternative means that they're prepared to use at this point in time. If we go back to where we started this evidence session, we are talking about the, the difficulty of families who don't want to engage 
days in a traditional person-to-person -person contact or being in the same room as someone else or allowing people into their home. So there's a real challenge about how we make the service available, but then encourage people to take it up. So I don't see much greater harm you have to try and resolve at a later point. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a supplementary from Susie Davis. And can I remind ministers about concise answers, please? Susie. Yes, uh, thank you. Just as we're speaking about uh, uh, children and young people's mental health, um, I wonder if you can confirm whether you'd seen the UNCRC uh, reports about what, uh, what they call the grave physical and psychological effects on children and young people, um, and whether the operational guidance you've given out is, is responding to that in any way, or maybe there was something in that that you hadn't thought of and uh, you can respond to um, as we go along. Uh, I personally haven't read uh, that advice, but uh, the government's already concerned about the direct physical and mental health impact uh, of lockdown restrictions. Um, and you don't need to be a parent to recognise that that's a potential issue for children and young people. Uh, but I'm sure I haven't read it, um, but that's been signed so I can check with the officials they have and if that would change the advice and the position that we're already adopting, because we do regularly look uh, at a range of advice from a range of sources, including UN, World Health Organization and others. Thank you. Okay. And we are going to come on to children's rights. But um, as you know, Minister, the prevention of young suicide is a cause that is very close mm -hmm. to my heart. Can I ask what assessment the Welsh Government has made of uh, an increase in suicide among children and young people uh, during this pandemic and because of this pandemic? Um, well, apart from the general concern that I've expressed, um, on mental health generally, we we are already investigating. We're having a we've, we've commissioned through the government for the delivery unit to work with the national advisory group, including Dr. Anne John and other people, to review the current unexpected deaths during uh, the the start of the pandemic here in Wales, because we want to try to understand um, the wider concerns about the potential uh, effect of the restrictions on the mental health well-being of children and people, and if that is leading to a spike in suicide. Uh, or not. So that's why we've commissioned that review to, to be carried out with the current numbers of unexpected deaths that we have. So we're able then to provide a report uh, to understand where we are. And my understanding is that we should have a report on that review by before the end of this month. And obviously, I know the committee's got an interest. So if it's helpful, we can write to you once we've had a chance to receive the report and look at it. Yes, please. Thank you. And um, in terms of um, provision of crisis care, then, how has that been impacted um, by the pandemic? Are those crisis services available for children and young people who need them at the moment? Yes, they continue to be available. We still have seven day a week crisis care. We've made clear that mental health services, including for children and young people, are essential services uh, to be provided. They're not services to be scaled down. They are not part of the series of uh, measures that I stopped within the health service on the 13th of March. Um, you know, we, uh, we have built up those crisis care services over a period of time, and the last thing I want to see is to see them disappear during this period of time when there are well understood concerns about uh, emotional and mental health. Okay, thank you. And uh, moving on to perinatal mental health. Uh, this morning I hosted a um, round table with the NSPCC where we heard about lots of good practice that's going on in terms of supporting uh, new mothers and their families in this period. But I wondered if you can tell the committee um, what you were doing as a government to make sure that there is consistent perinatal support for all women across Wales in what is a difficult time for any new mother, let alone mm. in a pandemic. Yeah. Well, uh, we, can, we continue again to provide our perinatal mental health service. That's not been stopped either. Um, we've also been looking at how that's provided on a phone or online basis where possible, because again, the same concerns exist about physical contact with people. So we're looking to make sure that the progress isn't lost that we've made. We know there's more to go. Uh, so the service may have changed, but it still absolutely exists. Uh, and again, part of the challenge is uh, in all of this about the pause or the interruption in work to create the inpatient capacity uh, that I previously committed to. So uh, I want to understand what that really means. But again, the problem is, at this point in the pandemic, I can't give you an answer about what that means for that inpatient provision. We're still committed to it, but I'm concerned about the time frame. That is partly about the length, the extent. Uh, but again, I'm, 
I'm really impressed by the continuing commitment of our staff to deliver this service uh, for women in what is a particularly uncertain time. Um, it's different enough in terms of the challenge, in terms of perinatal mental health, uh, in normal times about people being prepared to come forward and then receive the sort of response they'd want, even more so now. Is the Welsh Government aware that there's apparently been a decrease in the numbers of women being willing to look at a mother yes. and baby unit provision? And will you be taking that into account in your planning? Because obviously we wouldn't want people to think that was because of a lack of need. It's down to fear and, and the lockdown. Uh, so, yes, we're aware there's been a reduction of people uh, wanting to make use of the service or being prepared to make use of the service, probably a better phrase. Uh, because we know that's the same in a range of other areas. You know, there aren't fewer people having strokes than there were uh, at this period of time last year. The reason why the figures are different is the way that people are behaving because of their concerns about coronavirus. So I certainly wouldn't be using this period of time to plan for the need that exists for a facility that we want to create. So I'm happy to give that assurance, Chair. Thank you. And um, the next questions are from Susie Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's, it's a straightforward word, really. We, obviously, we have the detail of the Third Sector Resilience Fund uh, and the, uh, well, the two funds, aren't there, on for uh, third sector organisations. But can you give us some indication of how much of that support is being targeted to children and young people? Um, and perhaps you can specifically mention how much of the £6.3 million for hospices is for children's hospices? I don't mind who answers that one. Start on deputy, I mean, the dep deputy minister would like to come in, I think. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I'm sure um, the committee is aware, um, as Susie has said, of the funds that are available um, for third sector services. Um, the uh, deputy minister and the chief whip, of course, announced on the 6th of April, the 24. Um, million pounds and Welsh Government Third Sector COVID-19 Response Fund and that of course is um, more than we would have had as a result of consequentials from the, the Welsh Government. Um, uh, they can also benefit from the £400 million economic resilience um, fund but I am aware that some groups can't, don't benefit um, from that. Um, and they may not qualify for that. So we've also got third sector support being delivered by WCVA, um, such as the Voluntary Services Emergency Fund, which supports volunteering, and the Third Sector Resilience Fund, supporting organisations to stay afloat. Um, and we are working very closely with the third sector on issues such as support for fostering services, care leavers, and repurposing funding so that they can support the crises. Um, and Voices from Care has developed a specific offer for care leavers and the fostering network provides extended helplines um, and we've got lots of examples of third um, sector partners working um, with children and young people. Um, uh, Childline bases in Wales remain open and operational and still, re um, still providing information and support um, and actually about 50% of contact with Childline at the moment are to do with COVID-19. Um, NSPCC has put together a support page for young people about COVID-19. NSPCC um, UK Helpline um, have also reported um, uh, uh, an, a decrease in calls resulting in a referral to children's social services at the start of the lockdown period, but since then the numbers have actually um, arisen. So there's lots of examples um, of help for children. Mike, um, action for children and of course Voices for Care have come up with their own specific um, uh, uh, package. Um, in terms of the actual percentage that is being um, spent um, on uh, children, I can't give you an actual figure for that, um, but certainly there are a whole range of um, projects that are there helping children and I think the um, Minister for Health and Social Services will be able to respond to the hospice uh, question. Um, yeah, it's we... about 1.5 million from the 6.3 that's gone to T. Gobeith and T. Haven, Susie. Uh, thank you very much for that. So it's about 25%. Perhaps if we could ask the Deputy Minister when she's in a position to do so to let us have a note. Uh, I suppose what I would, bef before we finish on this point, I could ask the Deputy Minister again about whether any of the things you've been talking about now uh, is additional money because obviously these are you mentioned yourself one of these funds is 24 million pounds some of the work you mentioned is continuity of existing work uh, so again if you don't have the answer to hand perhaps you could send us a note in due course about um, how much extra yes. is going in 
Um, yes, I think most of the things I mentioned are things that are already there. And the £24 million is for support and extra help. So any more information I can, um, I can send to you. Lovely, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next questions then are from Dawn Bowden on safeguarding and child protection. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Deputy Minister, because one of the questions I was going to ask was around some of the, the work that you've been doing with the with the third sector on uh, safeguarding and child protection, and I think you've you've covered that. But what, what I what I'm particularly um, keen to to find out is 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 how you're monitoring the uh, the impact. Uh, of coronavirus on child and protection, uh, child protection and safeguarding uh, in in the round. I know that the the health minister raised this raised this as a concern in plenary uh, only recently, and it's it's really you know how how we are monitoring it and what concerns have been identified and and how we're going to start to to tackle some of those. Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Dawn, uh, for that um, question. And um, obviously, um, it is difficult um, uh, to monitor if there's not easy access um, to um, the children that we're referring to. And that's why we have been trying to encourage the vulnerable children to go into um, school or childcare settings. And there's been a lot of encouragement for that to happen. Um, the Minister, um, the uh, Director of Education, the Director for Social Services sent out a joint letter recently to all the local authorities asking them to try to encourage the vulnerable children and the families to um, get the children to go to school um, and in fact we've now got um, 890 um, uh, vulnerable children attending school settings and that's the highest number that um, we've had at all since the opening of the scheme but it's still only a tiny drop in the ocean but it's very good and it is it, it is progress that the numbers of attending are now, go, are now going up but of course there are a lot of children um, who are not attending school and who um, uh, are, 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 people are not necessarily uh, the social services are not necessarily um, uh, seeing and there has been a drop in safeguarding referrals to social services um, those numbers are now beginning to go up but there certainly was a significant drop, which um, is a great deal of concern. Um, one local authority, in fact, reported a drop of 27% um, uh, in terms of safeguarding referrals compared to this time next year. Um, so um, I issued a written uh, statement on the 1st of May, um, setting out the work taken forward under our cross-departmental vulnerable children, young people and safeguarding work screen and encouraging people to report any safeguarding concerns there are. Because obviously um, we are dependent on the public authorities, you know, schools and health services to report any concerns. And at the moment, Obviously, they're not there to report them. Um, so we have made this public appeal for everyone to look out for each other. And um, I was very interested in what Sean Gwentlian told me about what was being done in um, Anglesey in terms of sending out a, a message of via social media um, to get people to look and listen and to um, raise their concerns because obviously safeguarding is the concern of everybody in the, the community. Um, but um, I think that... Um, we are um, reassured in terms of our contact um, with the local authorities that they are in fact keeping close touch as far as they possibly can with all the children that are vulnerable. And for those where it is very critical, face-to-face -face contact is still taking place. And there are imaginative ways of trying to keep in touch with all the other children and families. So it is a difficult situation. We are concerned about it, but um, I think as much as possible is being done. Jean, you wanted to come in on that? Uh, just to add on to, to what the Deputy Minister was saying, the uh, health visiting service has not been um, stopped or stepped back. It has uh, consolidated some of the ways that it does the Healthy Child Wales programme. But for those families that are identified as having particular need or have children that are particularly vulnerable, all the normal contacts have been maintained. So they're not um, uh, unseen to the normal health visiting service. And that covers both flying staff and general health visiting areas. Thank you. Just what, thank you, um, Jean, for that. And, and um, Deputy Minister, is, is there any 
um, it, it, would, would, would there be any value at this point in actually revisiting the, the, the current Welsh Government definition and guidance around vulnerable children in terms of, you know, what we, who we identify as vulnerable? Because this, is, this kind of opens up a, a whole new uh, group of, of children that we probably, you know, th th that are not necessarily known to services, but can still be, can still be vulnerable. So it's, it's just, you know, looking at the, the, the current guidance that we have. Do you think that needs revisiting at all? Um, well, the definition um, of vulnerable children and young people includes those with a social worker and with statements of special education needs, and the most vulnerable of these um, should be prioritised. But um, we have now um, looked at this again, and we've set out an expanded definition, and we intend to publish that um, this week. Okay. Um, and this does include discretion for local authorities um, to have some flexibility and to be able to offer a place um, who may be on the edge of receiving care and support if they are known to be vulnerable um, by the school or by family support um, services, because obviously the children that we know about, <laughs> we know about, yeah, but absolutely. there are those other children um, who may, you know, as be on the edge of care, the children that we've tried, been trying very hard as part of our policies in the Welsh Government to keep with their families with a lot of support and you know those are the ones that um, we also want to support. So we are giving uh, discretion to the local authorities in order to um, have a degree of flexibility and that will be uh, published this week. Okay, thank you. Thank you Chair. Thank you. We're going to move on now then to talk about uh, looked after children and children at the ed on the edge of care with questions from Janet Finch Saunders. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you set out the impact the coronavirus emergency has had on the care system, including edge of care services and where have there been areas of concern? Um, well, local authorities have obviously have to change their working practices um, in, in response to the, um, the COVID um, um, emergency. Um, so um, a RAG rated risk assessment was adopted by all local authorities um, at the start um, of the pandemic um, uh, to ensure that vulnerable children and families um, receive the right um, way of receiving services and the frequency of contact from the services. And this is being dealt with on a case by case basis. So every case that is known is being RAG rated and services are being linked um, to that. And also there's very close contact between Welsh Government officials and the local authorities. There are weekly meetings between officials and the um, uh, heads of the children's um, services. Um, and, um, you know, I, I can't say too highly really about the amount of support and mutual work that has been going on. And um, we've been assured that there have been no significant increases in the numbers of looked after children and the number of placement breakments are, are minimal. Um, and the other um, interesting, um, you know, good point is the children's um, services uh, workforce remains at 90% plus. And obviously that is a great testimony to, um, you know, to the dedication of the workforce. Um, so there's very close contact. The children are all being um, monitored um, individually. And I think in the circumstances, we're all um, uh, doing what we possibly can. Um, I know that um, Albertini um, is um, able probably to respond in more detail to the contact. Okay, I'll move if you'd on like to, to have that. Or... Um, I think we'll move on to the next okay. question. And can I remind everyone again, sharp, focused questions and concise answers. Janet. Thanks. How is Welsh Government ensuring that vulnerable children have access to the necessary technology to maintain contact with their social workers and other support workers and networks? Um, well, it is a normal practice to ensure that um, uh, children and families do have appropriate access of technology to keep in touch uh, with uh, social workers. So that is part of our um, normal practice. We're very keen um, as the Welsh Government that no children are left behind um, in their education during this period. Um, so last month, as you will know, the Minister of Education announced three million pounds of funding to help uh, digitally excluded learners um, so that they've got access to the internet um, so that they can fully participate in online um, learning. So that's, you know, we do normally ensure that they've got uh, digital contact for social workers. And thank you. And can you set out the picture regarding children's residential care? What are the challenges these care settings are facing? And have any children's homes closed? 
Um, well, um, residential um, children's homes are not really um, reporting any particularly difficult um, issues, um, and certainly they have been able to resolve any issues that um, have happened. So I'm very pleased, um, you know, to report um, that. Um, we. Uh, we obviously expect um, all children in residential care to be supported, to keep contact with their, um, their families um, and with their siblings. And that is going on, although it may be um, by uh, technology ra rather than face to face. Um, we know that some young people um, have found the social distancing a challenge. And I think it's um, easy for us to understand that um, they have found that um, quite difficult. Um, so there have been a few um, issues related to that. But where that has happened, um, local authorities have been able to resolve that um, um, on a case by base basis and really there's not any major issues. In terms of um, uh, uh, residential um, care, Hillside is um, functioning well, uh, no reporting um, issues, um, uh, the staffing levels are normal, there's less children and young people there. So in fact, there's been an opportunity to give a great deal of attention to the children. And I think we've had very good reports about how um, that has happened. Um, so I, I am absolutely reassured by um, our officials here that everything is as well as it could be. And I also meet with the Children's Commissioner once a month, who is an independent, uh, once a week, who is an independent source. And she said, when I met her last week, well, as far as we know, it's all good news. So I don't think we have any concerns at the moment about the residential care. OK, moving on to foster care. Um, how is Welsh Government working with local authorities to meet the challenges set out by the Association of Fostering and Adoption Cymru in its fostering guidelines? Um, um, well, we have um, uh, worked with the fostering um, or, or organisations. We have had close um, communications um, with them um, and um, we've um, supported um, AFA Cymru to develop guidance for foster carers um, and that guidance has been um, very strongly welcomed across the, the sector. Um, we're working with the third sector, I think I mentioned before about um, uh, specific issues such as support for fostering services and of course care leavers. Um, the fostering network has extended its helpline hours and of course Voices from Care, I mentioned them uh, before, have developed this um, particular offer of support um, for care leavers and um, I've been reassured as well from Voices from Care that um, uh, um, the young people appear to be more stable now um, that they have contact with, but that's an online help um, help for them. Um, so we have had, um, uh, you know, quite a lot of contact with the fostering um, services. So on that, my final point to that then, Foster Network and others, as you know, have called on foster parents who can temporarily no longer foster due to the coronavirus emergency to be paid a retainer with all foster carers receiving extra financial support for additional expenses. What is your position on this please? Um, well, we haven't had any specific representations from local authorities um, asking for support um, for the um, fostering um, uh, for foster carers, but some local authorities have paid retainers and some people, I believe, have increased the amount of money that um, they are um, paying. Um, they've also um, uh, um, given support for various um, activities um, and um, things have helped sometimes, I think, with broadband access and that sort of issues. And obviously, foster carers who do require additional support should be uh, support, uh, approaching their local authorities or the independent fostering agency. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Albert, I just wanted to check there wasn't anything you wanted to add, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I think the only thing to add was that on relation to monitoring, the Minister has indicated that we um, are speaking weekly with heads of children's services and we do now have a data collection that's been implemented to capture the critical data in relation to the children's services. So uh, that will assist us in our monitoring arrangements going forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. And um, the next questions then are from Susie Davis. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to have a quick, uh, quick answer from you, probably Minister, I think, about the primary uh, legislation and the regulations which followed. 
about which uh, which children's rights impact assessments have been done have any been done and can they be shared with the committee if they have um sorry deputy minister my mistake um yes um it well it's been a very difficult um time as you appreciate in terms of the having to make um, legislation very quickly and it hasn't been possible to do the impact assessments that we would normally do however i am um, um, you know very pleased to say that we are actually launching a survey of children um, well it's, we're going to be launching it um, next week and this is um, uh, to try to get uh, from children their views of what's happened, uh, what we've been doing, and their views on the whole COVID-19 situation. Um, so we're doing this in conjunction with the Children's Commissioner and with Young Wales um, and with the Youth Parliament. So this is an a online survey that we hope will be going out to thousands of children, um, and we will get their response in terms of what, um, what are the important um, issues that have arisen for them, what they feel about um, what's happened um, during this period, what they feel about the way that we've dealt with the schools, um, the way that um, uh, they've had to cope in not going to school and being um, at home for so long. And so we're trying to get um, a, a, a feedback from, um, from young people. So I'm very pleased that um, we're doing that. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of um, impact assessment, it has been very difficult, as you, I'm sure you can imagine, um, to be able to do those at these times. I, I don't think that Albert wants to come in um, on that. Yes, because um, I'll pursue that in a sec. Yes. Yeah. Albert. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And I think Nicola indicated it before me, so apologies, Nicola. Um, so just, just to say um, for the committee, uh, really importantly, that we haven't um, introduced any easements in relation to children's services legislation. Uh, I think that's really quite crucial. So from a Welsh context, um, the standards that are in place do remain. So therefore, they wouldn't have been um, a necessity for us to do a, a children's rights impact assessment in relation to the, the primary legislation. I think that's particularly a strong point for us in, in Wales, both for, in terms of safeguarding arrangements, but also ensuring that, that children's rights are protected at a crucial time. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, in terms of childcare and education, we're obviously looking at the provisions under the Coronavirus Act to um, allow us to maybe ease some of the statutory requirements, and we are going to be undertaking a full suite of impact assessments on those. Um, obviously, the Coronavirus Act itself was UK government legislation, and, and they, they ran their own impact assessments. But in terms of how we implement it in the childcare and education space, and I think Albert was just saying the same thing, we'd definitely be looking at those impacts in terms of going forward. Okay, um, well, just to come back on that then, are, are you saying to me that as a result of the various coronavirus uh, regulations that we've had, that no assessments for children's uh, needs have been postponed, cancelled, or sort of uh, done very quickly online rather than in person? Um, well, I think, um, as um, Albert said, that there were uh, no relaxation of regulation for children's social care. You know, that's, there haven't been any um, in, um, in Wales. No, no, but that, that's what the, there's no relaxation. But what's happening in practice? Uh, you know, we, we're down on staff across all our, our council, uh, councils and in our third sectors. Who's, who's doing the children's needs assessments, particularly for young carers? Um, well, I, 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 Albert, can you answer that? I think I think the first thing to say um, to the committee is that um, you know going back we we took a very strong line at the beginning that we weren't going to introduce easements in requirements to children's social services. Of course, for the way that practitioners and social work practitioners have to operate, uh, they are having to operate through a, a a different time. So assessments are still taking place for child protection and safeguarding concerns, assessments are still taking place, and especially in relation to, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, in relation to young carers to support the needs. So arrangements, such as that, but they're having to be slightly differently done. So, you know, some of the technology and keeping in contact and keeping those visits. Um, so we've used, for example, the St. David's Day Fund to make sure that care leavers are well supported in terms of having contact and are accessible and able to engage as well. So we're having to be a little bit more 
uh, and social services departments uh, are having to be a little bit more innovative in the use of technology and the way that they've engaged as well. But personal visits are taking place uh, and visits, especially as the minister mentioned earlier on, um, they actually individually assess each case to determine the frequency of visits to make sure that uh, those contacts are maintained with children at critical time. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I don't want to take this much further, but the, the you know the, the, the personal visits and social distancing could be uh, slightly slightly problematic. I just want to finish with this one question, if I may. Uh, we've had recommendations from the Carers Trust or Carers Trust Wales. Um, have they been accepted um, by government? And is it those that are uh, sort of driving the agenda of the task and finish group that um, you announced the other day, Deputy Minister? Well, those will certainly be considered by the task and finish group. Um, uh, and I've had a letter, you know, from the Carers Trust about those issues, and we are setting up this group, as you know, and we will be looking at those issues in the group. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And uh, can, uh, any steer on when that might report? Um, I I don't have that at the moment. Okay, thank you. maybe we could have a note on that, Deputy Minister. Can thank I you. just say we are running short of time? We did start late, so if the ministers are happy, we'll carry on until ten past two, ten past uh, three, if that's okay. Um, and the next questions are from Sean Gwenllian. Oh, ni isio gofyn cwestiynau ynglyn ar sector gofal plant um, i feddwch chi ddir prwy wynidog yn gwybod um, oherwydd da ni wedi trafod hyn. Um, no. Hold on no. a sec, Sean. We've lost translation again. Can we just see what can be done to get the translation back? Sorry, Sean. Is, is there anyone that can help with the translation? Translation is now available. There you go. Sean, thank you. So you will know, Deputy Minister, because we have discussed this in private session, my major concerns with regard to the childcare sector and what kind of childcare sector we will have at the end of this crisis as families start to return to the workplace. There are still some childcare providers falling between the cracks and aren't receiving financial support do you agree? Are there people who are still not being supported? And why isn't the Welsh Government able to provide that support for everyone in the childcare sector? Um, thank you, Sean, um, for that um, question. And I know that we have, um, we know we have had a discussion um, about this um, before. And Basically, we are aware that there are some sectors in the childcare sector that do fall through um, some of the loops. Um, we have guaranteed that we will pay um, the, the money for the childcare offer um, for three months. Um, so that is guaranteed uh, to them. And they are able to uh, take advantage of the uh, government's uh, job uh, retainer scheme. Um, but that does mean uh, that there is a problem, as I think we discussed before, um, of the double funding um, issue. And that is something that we are uh, have been trying to resolve. Um, um, and there have been discussions with um, the Treasury in um, Whitehall about ways forward on this. Um, I'm going to ask Nicola to come in in a minute because she's much more up to date with the discussions about that. Um, but so far, I don't think uh, very much progress has been made on that. But we are looking to see if there are any other ways that we can get help to the childcare sector. And I'm actually following this meeting with a meeting um, with the Deputy Minister um, for Equality and Chief Whip, who is responsible for the voluntary sector, because obviously many of the groups that we're talking about would come under the voluntary um, sector because they have voluntary committees, um, but they fall between many um, stools because they rent premises rather than own premises and they don't have high turnovers that would qualify them for some of these um, uh, some of uh, some of these grants. Um, so could, uh, perhaps I could ask Nicola to come in to expand yeah. on that. 
Absolutely. Nicola? Yeah, um, Briefly, I'll, try and, I'll try and be brief because I'm conscious of time. Um, so some childcare settings can access funding under the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme, but certainly not all of them. Some of them can access funding under the Economic Resilience Fund. And as the Deputy Minister said, we're following up for some of them to be able to access funding under the Third Sector Resilience Funding. All childcare settings can apply for the UK government's coronavirus job retention scheme, but there are some complications around that in that it's a salary based scheme and you can't claim two types of public funding for the same individual member of staff. So if you were using funding under the childcare offer to pay for a particular member of staff's salary, you can't access CJRS and furlough that individual with government money as well. And that has led to some confusion and complication about how that balances, which we're trying to work through with the sector and with local authorities around the rules and regulations that um, the Treasury and HMRC have put in place around that. Um, alongside that, there's a whole range of different loans and services that are available. Some of those are less attractive to some childcare settings, but they are still available. And Business Wales is offering support and advice for settings on how they can help weather this storm and support their workers as best they can. Um, we're also having some conversations now with our economy colleagues and with Business Wales about what happens next, the recovery and the return of the sector. And we've just come out of a meeting with the childcare sector around the support they think they would need to have in place to be able to return from this as well. So it's, it's a topic that's very much live at the moment. I'm sure you can share my concerns and the concerns of Cullum, which represents the childcare sector and the nursery school sector, that there are a number of providers that aren't receiving support at all and are likely to collapse as a result of this. What I can't understand is why you, in collaboration with the Minister for the Economy, Ken Skates, can't devise a specific grant package for the providers that aren't currently receiving support, or will be facing a situation that is very difficult when people are seeking childcare for their children and those settings won't be available to them. Why isn't it possible to have a bespoke scheme for those that are falling between the cracks in this sector? Um, well, that is what we are looking to see if we can get a bespoke scheme. I absolutely agree um, with you. It is absolutely vital that we keep this sector going because it is a fragile sector in any case. Um, and about, I think about 50% of the childcare settings have temporarily closed down. And the reason they've given for closing down is because they haven't had enough children to make it viable to keep their settings going. Um, so it is a very, um, it is a very worrying situation. Situation. Um, they are heavily reliant on the fees that parents pay. And of course, with, um, uh, with the uh, social distancing and the uh, lockdown, this has meant that we've had to discourage children from attending. So that means the number of children they've had have been, it's been much reduced and it hasn't been viable for them to keep going. Although obviously we, it's great that some, about half have stayed open. So we have somewhere for the children of the critical workers and the vulnerable children um, to go. Um, but I absolutely agree um, with what you're saying, um, Sean, and we are looking for a solution because we, we know it's vital for not only for the children and their parents, but for the economy as well, that we do have that sector there surviving after this is all over. Um, so I can assure you we are working very hard and I think Nicola's working day and night to try to achieve, um, to achieve this. Uh, just an, an all like any record. Just finally, from me, I'm, I'm very pleased that you are working on this, and I very much hope that we will see a support package that will reach everyone in the sector because it's been weeks now since all of this started. And if there's still not light at the end of the tunnel for some of them, then that needs to be dealt with. But just to conclude, how effective has the provision been in general over this period in terms of providing support for key workers? Um, oh, I think it's been um, uh, crucial um, because it, how would um, the majority of the key workers have been able to um, get to work and do all the um, wonderful things that they've been doing if it hadn't been for childcare for those that need it? And we were very pleased um, to introduce um, the coronavirus childcare assistance scheme, which means that um, critical workers um, and um, families with vulnerable children are able to have free access uh, to 
uh, childcare aged naught um, to five. Um, and I believe that we are uh, the only um, country in the UK that is providing that free service to um, to the vulnerable um, children. And so I, 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 I mean, that scheme has only really uh, taken off now since Easter, so we don't have any um, particular statistics. Um. I, I do have some early numbers if you'd like me to announce them. Oh yes, that'd be very good. Yeah. So very briefly. Of, yes, in terms of the provision in schools, we're looking at around four thousand children a day in schools at the moment. Um, in terms of the the children accessing the coronavirus childcare assistance scheme, it has only been two weeks up and running really, so the numbers are quite low. But there were um, nearly one and a half thousand children accessing that childcare last week, and of those, just over a hundred would fall within the definition of vulnerable children. So it is it is picking up there. It was nine hundred children the week before that, so we are seeing some traction now that parents are aware that 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 support is there. Okay, okay thank you. And can I just ask, in terms of the um, the other vulnerable children, uh, what assurance can you, can you give that all the vulnerable children that need to keep in contact with social workers and other key workers are being provided with the necessary technology to do that? Is that happening in a uniform way? Um, well, that is the intention um, that that everybody should have the opportunity to have those um, the technology, the necessary technology, um, and certainly that is is what is intended. Okay, thank you, um, Susie. Very very briefly, one question on Kafka, please. Uh, just generally, have you had any feedback on the effects on the family courts and uh, uh, the execution of the uh, well, the child arrangement orders, the various versions of that? Um, yes. Um, well, in terms of the family courts, um, as you um, probably know, um, a lot of the hearings are going on virtually, um, but what the, the hearings that are more complex are being postponed um, to be heard at a later date. So that's one of the issues, really, that um, we may expect a lot of demand on the court service after this period um, has um, finished. Um, and obviously, the um, uh, well, the president of the family division um, has been has had has um, issued guidance um, on compliance with family court child arrangement um, orders, um, which um, were his um, guidance. And obviously this is directed at uh, um, uh, separated families subject um, to the family court. Um, and that offers general advice to parents, recognizing that the circumstances for each parent and each family will be um, uh, different. Um, and the Welsh Government has also provided a guidance about staying at home and away from um, others. But of course, um, where parents have joint parental responsibility, um, as you know, the, um, the government um, has said that um, children under 18 can be moved between the two households. With the other children, it's on a case by case um, basis, really, what actually happens. I have met with Kafkas um, to see how their operations um, were going and um, all their, their, their Kafkas um, officials are not attending any courts at all. They're sending in any of their views um, in, uh, virtually. Um, but um, it appeared to be that there weren't any major issues arising. Okay, thank you. And um, we have definitely now come to the end of our time. So can I thank the ministers and um, officials for attending? We do recognise what an immensely pressurised time this is for Welsh Government. And we are very appreciative of having your time this afternoon. So thank you both to ministers and officials. As usual, you will receive a transcript to check for accuracy following the meeting. Diolch fawr. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item three, then, can I propose in accordance with standing order 17.42 that the committee